Yeah, go on, go on, go on. Uh, David didn't mention that he's not on Twitter, uh, but he didn't get my Twitter gift that I sent him, sent him earlier in the week, which was um, a YouTube video of Bruce Springsteen singing Thunder Road, the acoustic version, at a conference, at a, uh, uh, an event in, in London last year. Uh, we, we very much share a passion for Bruce. Um, okay, so um, why making personalization work in mental health matters in 15 minutes? Oh my goodness. Um, okay, uh, that's a challenge, isn't it? Um, and it reminds me of one of my favorite poems. It would, wouldn't it? Uh, and, and this poem is a haiku. And I'm sure you all know that the Japanese haiku style is a 17-syllable rigid discipline uh, style for poetry. Uh, and my favorite haiku is by the Manchester punk poet John Cooper Clark. Who's heard of John Cooper Clark? Yeah, isn't he wonderful? He's coming back now after all those drugs all those years. Um, and this is, what, this is John Cooper Clark's haiku. To convey one's mood in 17 syllables is very difficult. So to tell you about mental health and personalization in 15 minutes is also, let me tell you, very difficult. And I've just spent two minutes of it on a joke. <laughs> <clears throat> so better carry on. Okay, so in, in essence, uh, why is this important? For me, it's important for four pretty simple reasons. One, because it works. Two, the least important reason, because it's policy. Three, shock horror, because people who get it like it, you know, why would we want to do that, but hey. Uh, and, and four, as, as David suggested, because it's just too hard to get in mental health. The, the research in both social care and, mental, uh, and, uh, and health shows that uh, people with mental health problems benefit amongst the most. You know, they get the best benefits uh, of any group uh, when they receive personal budgets, for example, but they're the least likely to get one uh, in many situations. And that's a situation that surely can't continue. Um, uh, David uh, made the, the very valid point that um, personalization isn't all about personal budgets, and, and we are very pleased at TLAP to, uh, to strongly support and endorse pastor personalization that looks much beyond personal budgets. Uh, and today's conference, many of the workshops look beyond personal budgets. I am going to focus just a little bit on personal budgets this morning, partly because I've only got 15 minutes. It's probably 12 now, isn't it? So um, just, just to make sure uh, that people are aware of some of the current uh, research in health and social care. So um, people probably will be aware that um, last November, a three-year control pilot uh, of the use of personal budgets um, uh, in health uh, concluded. Uh, this was researched uh, by a consortium of universities led by the University of Kent. Um, and I've just put uh, a few bullet points there uh, of the findings. One. There was strong evidence of the benefits of personal, personal health budgets, if implemented well, and we can implement anything badly, can't we, uh, for people who use mental health services. It was a three-year independent control trial. Uh, it found in general that personal health budgets led to better care-related quality of life, improved psychological well-being, and no deterioration in health. Um, there was a reduction in the use of other health services, such as GP attendance and inpatient admissions. Um, but, but perhaps particularly important uh, for this audience, the evaluation specifically identified that the approach appears to work particularly well for people with mental health problems and also to be cost effective for this group. Um, if you have a look on the University of Kent website, um, you will find uh, a series of uh, summary versions uh, uh, and interim versions of the research and the final version, which obviously is very long with lots of graphs and things. Um, but uh, those are, I, I would say those are four important bullet points to mention from that research. In terms of social care, um, uh, my organisation in control um, have a thing called the Personal Budgets Outcomes Evaluation Tool. And this is essentially a way of finding out directly from people who use social care and increasingly health care um, and their families um, what the impact of a personal budget is on their lives from their point of view. And it asks um, 14 questions. It, it, it considers 14 areas of people's lives. And it essentially asks, I see everybody straining to see that. I'll mention a couple of the points in a moment. Um, even people with really good glasses are going to struggle. Um, it, it, it looks at 14 uh, domains of people's lives and it asks, um, since you've got the personal budget, has your life got better, stayed the same, or got worse in each of these areas? And it also gives people the opportunity to write in their comments. 
Uh, and I suppose if you had to put the, the, the findings into a nutshell, and the, the most recent findings were published as the National Personal Budget Survey of over 2,000 people and 1,000 family members from 22 local authorities. In a nutshell, the findings would be um, outcomes in my life, pretty good, process, pretty rubbish. Um, in terms of the experience of people with mental health problems receiving personal budgets in the survey, um, this graph just gives you some indication. The blue is people with mental health problems and the green is uh, the average of all groups. And you see that in some areas, of, uh, some of the 14 areas, there's quite significant um, uh, responses where people are saying that uh, things have got better for them. Over 70% saying mental, mental well-being improved. Um, plus 60% better control over the alive, plus 70% uh, greater independence, plus 70% getting greater control over support, plus 70% um, improved dignity. Significant numbers on feeling safe and uh, on relationships with paid staff. Um, the, the, the results are fairly consistent now over a, a number of years and increasingly show us also not just um, the outcomes that people achieve with personal budgets, but also the differences that are experienced um, by people living in different places or people having different experiences of, of the process of getting and using a personal budget. So we're increasingly able to, uh, to see what are the factors that lead to better or worse outcomes. In terms of policy, uh, just again, uh, my point about policy, uh, we have the NHS mandate. So there's a number of areas in which personalisation uh, features in NHS policy, but I'll just show you this from the NHS mandate, the particular objective on patient participation in care, uh, which talks about the NHS becoming dramatically better at involving patients, empowering them to manage and make decisions about their own care and treatment, a very specific thing, by 2015, more people managing their own health, everyone with long-term conditions, including mental health, being offered a personalised care plan. That's been a long time coming. Patients who could benefit have the option to hold a personal health budget. And I think that, linking back to David's point that um, this isn't all about personal budgets, it's very important to put personal budgets in the context of a number of the mechanisms that uh, hopefully increasingly will be used in health services so that people can take uh, greater control uh, and share uh, decision making with clinicians and professionals. Shared decision making, self-management, personal health budgets, information, personalised care planning are all part of the same thing. In terms of uh, social care policy, um, I'm not sure how much of the audience is a social care audience today, but um, essentially three things have come together in social care over the past couple of years. Uh, three, three elements that have led to the current legislation that's going through Parliament. We had a, a Law Commission report where they looked at uh, social care law um, in the context of that law being um, old. Uh, much of it dates back to 1948 and there's a lot of statutes and, and fragmentation. And so the, the decision was to create a single modern statute for social care. Law Commission made a series of recommendations which have been incorporated into the developing policy. We had uh, the Dilnock Commission report, um, uh, the, the report that looked into the future funding of social care. And very importantly, we had the social care vision uh, that emerged in 2010. And each of those things uh, were pulled together into um, uh, something called the Caring for Our Future Engagement, which took place at the end of uh, 2011, leading to the Care and Support White Paper uh, and a progress report on funding, and then to a draft care bill uh, a consultation and scrutiny period, and then May the 8th, uh, the care bill um, was in the Queen's speech. Morning. Um, so we have a care bill. Um, just to remind people about the social care vision, which largely um, uh, populates the, uh, the care bill. Um, I, I was still working in the Department of Health at the time that the, uh, the vision was being developed, um, and uh, for some reason it became very important that everything began with P. Uh, and we ended up with seven P's. Woe betide you if you suggested anything going in that vision that didn't begin with P. Uh, so people would be sending emails around saying, I really think this should be in, and somebody says, it just doesn't begin with P. And so people would work very hard to make it begin with P. Uh, my favourite is plurality. What? What? <laughs> Um, and you challenge anybody to remember what those seven P's are. But the, the, there's uh, some very important P's in there, and one of them is personalisation. 
Uh, and the headline uh, in that chapter was, Individuals, not institutions, take control of their care. Personal budgets, preferably, preferably as direct payments, are provided to all eligible people. Information about care and support is available for all local people, regardless of whether or not they fund their own care. Personalisation in the context uh, of a bunch of other important things. So, Care and Support Bill uh, says, let's be really clear about this, by 2015, all people eligible for ongoing council-funded social care will receive that as a personal budget. In, in its basics, that simply means that you're told how much you can have for your care and support. There are then a number of options about how you use that. There are provisions in the care bill to, to better enable the integration of personal budgets, especially with health. And the Think Local Act Personal Sector Leadership Partnership is, has recently launched a personal budgets integration programme with the NHS Confederation, Sky, ADAS and others. David talked about coming from the King's Fund uh, uh, big event this morning, launching their new commission. And integration is once again flavour of the month uh, in public services. You can't walk down the street with, without integration slapping you across the face, it seems, sometimes. Uh, what concerns me sometimes is that uh, a lot of these conversations about integration seem to be a bit highfalutin. Uh, they seem to be operating at the level of service and system, uh, and there isn't enough discussion in those conversations uh, and those initiatives around integration at, level, at the level of the individual, directed and controlled by the individual. Um, that's what we're interested in focusing on. Now, um, how does all this come together? Uh, well, i just give you an example of, uh, of two organisations that are, that are uh, seeking to pull it together, interestingly. Uh, and these two organisations are the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services and the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who recently published a joint statement uh, on personal budgets. I'll just read out the, the quote. It says, The Association of Directors of Adult Social Services and the Royal College of Psychiatrists are committed to facilitating recovery for people with mental health problems and support the use of personal budgets in social care and personal health budgets in the NHS as tools for recovery. Now, I don't think any of us in this room uh, will kid ourselves that a statement from uh, two organisations like this changes the world. Um, but it's a useful statement to have, isn't it? So some big issues going forward, and, and these big issues uh, will be tackled in the presentations and the workshops today. Because what you have today, fantastically, uh, is people who've been working away at this. Uh, over quite a number of years now, and people who know uh, the myriad of challenges and problems in making personalisation work for mental health, uh, and yet have been determined and resilient uh, to drive it forward, because they know that it works, and, it, and they know uh, that people deserve it. Big issues, David touched on these. The organisational and cultural barriers do seem especially high in mental health. And then there's the really big question of doing it right. Uh, I was at an event recently where somebody, I think, quoted George Michael saying, if you're going to do it, do it right. Was that, was that wham? Um, please, God, if we're going to do it, do it right. We increasingly know how to do it right. Uh, we know what the process and practice conditions are, but very often they're not present. What might be some of those, um, those uh, process conditions? Uh, interesting, we had a look at... Um, the factors that were robustly associated to positive outcomes in, uh, for people with mental health in the National Personal Budget Survey. And here were some things. Getting help to plan the budget from someone in the NHS. Interesting. Um, feeling that their views are included in the support plan and the council making all aspects of the personal budget process easier. These, these might seem fairly obvious things. Uh, and yet, uh, when we compared council to council, we found uh, a significant number of councils not operating these process conditions. Uh, the one in the middle was very, very significant. If you uh, answered yes to the question, do you feel your views were strongly included in your support plan, the chance of you uh, uh, getting improved outcomes in some of the key areas was uh, increased by a factor of several, uh, several, you know, four times in, in some cases. So I, I just pulled out a few of the things that ADAS and the Royal College say that need to be worked on because I think some of these things are right. We need to work on increasing the low take-up of personal budgets for individuals with mental health problems. Uh, and some of the ways to deal with that are tackling unnecessary bureaucracy. This seems particularly heavy in mental health in comparison to some other areas, and it's bad in all areas. Uh, and a lack of information amongst clinical staff. 
Developing the right to an integrated assessment across the NHS and social care, and an integrated support plan, and a single individual budget, and an integrated review. Why don't we put this stuff together? Uh, and then developing integrated personal budgets to support recovery. And then thinking more highfalutin, developing models of integration uh, uh, and, and to work together to overcome the barriers to integration to promote recovery for individuals with mental health problems. I think those are some of the key things to work on. None of them are particularly easy things, um, but the prize is, is very significant. And it seems to me uh, that, that now is the time to really start driving this. It, it doesn't seem to me to be acceptable now when we increasingly know what I said right at the start, that people with mental health problems can benefit the most from this, and yet they're accessing it the least. Thank you.